You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Revision Path. My name is Maurice Cherry. And before we jump into this week's interview, just want to let you know it is that time of year again. Time for our annual audience survey. Revision Path has been around now for seven years, which is an eternity in the podcasting space. And to that end, we've really ended up becoming a platform to showcase black designers and developers and digital creatives from all over the world. So we want to know how we can make this better. We need your input so we can grow and sustain ourselves in this design media landscape. And of course, give you more of these great conversations that you tune in for that you really will not find anywhere else. So to take the survey, head over to revisionpath.com forward slash survey and fill it out. Should take about five minutes or so. And we'll even choose one lucky survey respondent to win a $250 amazon.com gift card. Something I know could definitely come in handy during these times. Again, that survey is at revisionpath.com forward slash survey. The survey will be up until the end of the month, May 31st. Uh, Thank you so much for your time and, of course, for your feedback as well. Now let's talk about our sponsors, Facebook Design and Abstract. Facebook Design is a proud sponsor of Revision Path. To learn more about how the Facebook design community is designing for human needs at unprecedented scale, please visit facebook.design. This episode is also brought to you by Abstract, design workflow management for modern design teams. Spend less time searching for design files and tracking down feedback and spend more time focusing on innovation and collaboration. Like Glitch but for designers, Abstract is your team's version control source of truth for design work. With Abstract, you can version sketch design files, present work, request reviews, collect feedback, and give developers direct access to all specs all from one place. Sign your team up for a free 14-day trial today by heading over to www.abstract.com. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with Ariel Wiltz, a New York City-based UX designer currently in New Orleans. Now, we recorded this, of course, during the widespread lockdown efforts during the pandemic, so the audio quality might be a little crunchy in a few spots, so I apologize about that. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Arielle Wills, and I am an interaction designer currently working at Frog Design as a design consulting firm, one of the largest ones in globally, actually. Nice. Now, what's a regular day like for you there? And I know that this is probably a, a odd question to ask given what we're going through right now with this pandemic, but talk to me kind of like what your regular day to day is like. Yes, my regular day to day before the pandemic was usually typically within Frog. We're in teams. So the teams are um, filled with like strategists, depending on the project, um, industrial designers, VD designers, interaction designers like myself. And we usually really coming together to brainstorm on whatever the project that we're currently working on. So sometimes it's a lot of whiteboarding the day and sometimes it's a lot of heads downs like executing the project other times you may be for myself especially being interaction designer we're doing like user testing trying to understand um, how the users feel about the experience that we're creating so it really varies like every day how we work and function but usually when you're on a project at frog and you're with your team you're with your team for months so you're with that team the whole entire time. So it's usually like you in your little corner with your team, working, brainstorming, ideating. It sounds like there's a lot of just heads down work that you get to do to focus on a project. Yeah, it is a lot of heads down. So sometimes, so when I think of heads down, it's like me working by myself. A lot of times it's, Frog is really big with collaboration. They believe in like a lot of bringing ideas together, you know, especially from different disciplines. It's rare that I'm just working with people who are interaction designers. I'm usually working with people who are in all different types of disciplines. I haven't had the luxury to work with industrial designers, but I have worked with strategists before and 
CD designers, of course, and design technologists. So a lot of times we're like really working together. And then once we come with an idea or concept, we're going into like execution heads down. But I think it's so beautiful. One thing I learned from Frog that I absolutely love is the creative process. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> when I was in school studying, I used to feel like it just came from thin air. Like, how do you go from A to B, you know, like what is happening? But like with Frog and working collaboratively and Frog is really big on like design research and like um, pulling from all the research to really like conceptualize and coming out with these like amazing ideas. Because, you know, one thing about Frog is we push for the next big thing. So I think that's really phenomenal that I had the opportunity to learn this there. How did you get started at Frog? Actually, it's very interesting. I just really (laughs) applied more so. So my journey to user experience interaction design is really a fluke. One thing about the career that I'm in um, or the discipline I'm in, people go to like the top schools, right? People go to like School of Visual Arts, schools in Europe, school in Asia. They really work vigorously on their portfolio. They attend a lot of internships. Me, I just studied graphic design at Loyola and I didn't even want to do it anymore. So I was really big into like art nonprofits, helping out my community, decided to move to New York because that's what I always wanted to do. So I moved without a job or a place to live. And with my first job just doing digital project management, I just fell into it. So I fell into it and I just build my way into becoming a designer. A lot of ups, a lot of downs because I didn't have a lot of the resources like people at those types of schools. But when in 2016, when I finally was able to like build my foundation regularly at a full time job, I worked really hard at it. So when it came time for when I applied to Frog and I learned how to present, how to how to articulate my story, I think that's what really won them over. What kind of projects are you working on right now at Frog? As much of that as as you can mention. So I can't (laughs) I can't mention much, but Frog. A lot of the projects, I could tell you about the type of projects. So a lot of the projects um, within Frog, which is different from like other companies that I work with, because like I said, Frog is not one of the largest, but one of the top um, design consulting firms in the world. But what they do is is people come to us and really want us to reinvent and reimagine. So think of like any type of like healthcare, like how can we reimagine healthcare for the 21st century? Um, Frog is known for building like one of the first Macintosh and working with Steve Jobs, you know? So that's the history of Frog, um, really from industrial design to now into the digital age. And so a lot of the projects when people, when companies come to us and whether it's finance or entertainment or like I said, healthcare is really just reimagining the experience, reimagining how it can be done, coming up with completely new concepts that have never been done before. So that's why I say the creative process is just so unique to me and so amazing on how do you actually get there. And now you're also the lead of Frog's diversity and inclusion group there in New York. As much of that as you can talk about, I'm really curious because I don't hear about this a lot at design agencies. Like, how did that group begin? And as you're sort of leading it up, what sorts of things does the group do? So, Frog initially did start having a DNI, this amazing creative director in Austin, who I had the luxury, um, the pleasure to work with, Alexis. She used to own it. But I feel like in New York, we didn't really have anything. So one day, one of, again, one of my mentors at Frog, John Washerman, he was like, who wants to lead D&I? Because we had like a Slack channel. And so at the time I didn't, I was on a bench and I was like, sure, I'll lead it. And so we started to have just like workshops with people there. Like Frog, they're diverse in a sense, but when it comes to the numbers, as far as like Blacks, Latinos is very low. So we were just like the, everyone in it, no matter if you're a designer or not, we all came together and we were just like discussing like what does diversity mean to us and et cetera. And so from those conversations, I started two programs. One was Breaking Barriers, which was just like just a talk series open to the public where we had people, we invited people, but we for sure had people speaking people of color 
Because one thing like in design, I didn't believe 20% of it is people of color. And as far as blacks, it's only 5%, you know? So my goal was to, for us to actually see it. Because I think that's the big thing a lot of times is I don't see it. So I don't think I can do it. I really push for that to just have people, um, you know, all different types of people of color to like sit in those chairs and actually speak about their story. So that was very successful. And my baby, my favorite thing is um, for our mentors where it was a selective program where we reached out to, again, like I said, you know, when it comes to these, these companies, a lot of times they hire from like the top schools. And I was like, you know what, let's look at the state schools. Let's look at the local schools because of the local community college schools, because the truth of the matter is there's talent and innovators everywhere. So we found, I believe, like 28 people apply and we narrowed down to two amazing mentors. Shout out to Sarah and Lisa. And they worked vigorously with two creative directors and came up with amazing portfolios who are now working at amazing companies. So on BuzzFeed and I believe Gray Advertising. So, yeah, yeah. And that was like the first time doing it. It was like it was really prototype like i just hit the ground running and as we were going up yeah i created it and made it i did have help for like i said the mentors like the mentorship program was like a lot of work and we all have like design jobs as well you know like people have like departments just to do that but we worked really hard at it and i'm just i'm just so proud of my mentees and the difference that they're making just you know being their authentic selves in space in these spaces. And I think that brings me joy, honestly, like seeing other people coming through the doors who like, you know, look like me or represent another culture. That's what design needs because it could be very Eurocentric. Oh, it totally is Eurocentric here in the United <laughs> States. Totally, absolutely. Totally. Totally uh, Eurocentric. Now these kinds of, of DNI groups, I mean, I feel like I hear about them a lot from tech companies, like tech companies will have, some type of a, a group. Actually, we had back in December, Kendall House, who works for Red Hat, and he heads up their DNI group. But there's something that I kind of hear from tech companies. I don't really hear it from like agencies or design consultancies, like what Frog is. Why do you think it's important to have this kind of group at a company like Frog? Oh, it's so important because us as designers, especially in today's age, like everything that you do, everything that you experience has been designed out for you, you know, where it's like urban design, industrial design, like the product that you're using, the experience that you having, like, you know, like, for example, telehealth that everyone's using um, right now, especially with the pandemic, it's like everything's being designed for you. And if the majority of people who are designing it are white male, consciously or unconsciously, you know, you don't know, it become biased. Correct. So mm-hmm. I think it's so important to have a diverse representation, not only just of as race, like as abilities of like anything just to diversify it so other people can feel included and an experience and don't feel like left out. And especially since technology is taking such a hold with our society, people are being left out, which is so unfortunate. So I feel like one of my missions, especially as a designer, is to make sure I tr- do my part in bridging the gap. And so to me, that was what the mentorship was as a part to bridge the gap as far as, you know, with product design and like brand design, like even like with brand design and making sure that images of different types of people uh, from different cultures are included. So I definitely feel like it's important, especially when you're working at a company, that whole goal is to innovate. Like one thing that I love to say is diversity is innovation. Just imagine having a group of designers, engineers, industrial designers, strategists all in a room from all different types of backgrounds, including like economical backgrounds, because that's an issue too. Really thinking and brainstorming and strategizing a problem. Imagine the solutions that can come out of it. So that's why I feel like it's just extremely important, especially now, to diversify the industry. What's the best thing about what you do at Frog? You know what I have to say? I work with extremely amazing creative people. Mm -hmm. I have been blessed that I have worked with people who really I had 
two for sure managers or creative directors that have really pushed me to things that at levels that I couldn't even imagine. Also, just working very closely, like I said, you know, we work collaboratively, working very closely with the visual designers because that's who I often work with. I learn so much from them. So I think that the thing that I really enjoy working with is I feel like I'm blessed to have work with, like, for example, I said, Alexis from Austin, a creative director that's no longer there, Jared, my manager, Henry, like to work with people like that who really push me and just really, I feel like, I'm being taken to another level from mm. that. And then working with my coworkers too, like my VD coworkers for the most yeah. part. That's the ones who I usually work with. So. <laughs> yeah, it's really, I think that's what's really cool about it. Because you're working with the top people there. So Yeah. So given that collaboration is, is such a big part of not just the work that you do at Frog, but also it sounds like just the culture of working mm-hmm. at Frog. How have things been different now with this pandemic? Because now I'm assuming you're you're working from home. Probably everyone is working from home, I'm assuming, right? Right. Everyone's working from home right now. Yes, yes. Oh, man, it's been so different. Working from home, I feel like I'm working more working from home than I'm not really having a lot of downtime. Like I'm on the screen the whole entire time. And we have a lot of meetings, like this project I'm working on now. We have a a lot of meetings just to make sure everyone's in the loop. And like I said, with agencies, it's usually a lot of fast paced work as well. So I won't say difficult. I would say new, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's different. It's different in a sense. I feel like if after, if say if this, pandemic lasts until June, July, people would get used to it. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely new. I know the company did set up parameters of how to work from home and they leased out different softwares in order to do it, which is all cool. But just like really adjusting yourself to do it. Like I usually wake up early, have breakfast, do this, do that. And now I'm so tired because I feel like I go, 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 go the whole entire time. And it's not like I'm leaving work then coming home. My work is at home. Mm -hmm. So that's been really (laughs) new for me. But yeah, we still like still have meetings. Like everything is basically running the same way as it was running before. It's just the adjustment of working from home. Yeah, I feel like everybody at my company or everybody everywhere, if they don't really work from home, is like kind of struggling with. Yeah. Does it feel like Frog is extending some kind of, I don't know, grace during this time? Because this is a big shift for everyone, I'm assuming, you know, it's, it's not just the change in working from in an office to working at home, but like having the right setup in terms of your desk or chair or laptop or monitor, or even now, you know, you live in New York, but you're currently in New Orleans. So like now you're not even at your place, you're at a different place trying to kind of adjust to this. So hopefully Frog's, hopefully Frog is extending some grace with how you all are working from home and not expecting right away the same level of creative output, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know what? When you work at, like I said, a company like Frog, they're always going to expect <laughs> a top-notch creative output, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. That's just how it is. But I think what's beautiful is like my creative director right now, she, every single time we check in, she really does a check-in. Like, where, how are you? It's not just like a regular, oh, how are you doing today? It's like, seriously, how are you? You know, if you're feeling stressed, whatever, okay, maybe you need to take a walk. Maybe you need to step away. You know, so I think it's really the creative directors who really – Take, taking in and to account different things like how are you doing right now what's going on with you if you don't feel well you know really check it in like checking in way more than before because uh, that's what I love about the creative director now like you know every day she's really just checking in and saying like how are you and really having a conversation about it so I feel like that's really important right now because not only a frog. I feel like any company or like most companies, it still work. People are still going. People are still trying to make deadlines. And it's, it's really hard right now because um, I, you know, I'm fortunate right now that I don't know anyone who's sick or anything like that. But for people who do, you know, or people who do are going through it, are sick themselves or, you know, or man, I can't imagine even the health system, like we were saying earlier, you know, being so overwhelmed right now. So I think everybody at some level is feeling it, Yeah, you know? But yeah, I, yeah, like I said, um, the creative directors, they're aware of it. 
And I think that's what's good about it. Like, you know, we're human centered design, like we're making sure things are human centered within the team too. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. that's really needed right now. And it's happening. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Like, I hope that companies are extending just that grace because it's, I don't know, we know who people are at work in an office, but people's home lives and their work lives are completely different. Like some people use work as, I don't want to say as an escape, but that kind of feels like the best way to put it. Like they may not have the best home life and going Mm -hmm. to work is the thing that that's sort of their brief respite from whatever they might have to deal with, whether that's, I don't know, kids or a spouse or dealing with aging parents or anything like that. There's a lot of things that can go into play and like working from home is a, it's the option that we have to take right now. Right. But it's just, it's a lot. And then on top of all of that, just the overall impending news of the, of the pandemic right. and what's happening, like it wears on you. Oh, def. Oh, oh, definitely. It definitely wears on you. I remember one day before I came to New Orleans, I was in New York and I was, it was right before I started on the project. So I was like, you know, reading through files and getting prepped for it. And I was watching MSNBC the whole entire day. Yeah, It created so much anxiety <laughs> for me because I was just like, try. it was like, you know, when p- people are still trying to figure everything out. And that's something that's a big concern. Like I said, like, you know, I'm fortunate, but 100% there are there are mothers who are working from home now, dads and, you know, people who have like a ton of different businesses that they are running right now. And now to work from home and do everything, plus manage your kids, managing, like you say, your aging parents or possibly even if someone is sick right now. Yeah. So that definitely goes into play with everything. But for, like I said, being the design nerd, I think it's the time where people should you know like I said like start mobilizing more so like utilize your skills to help others right now there's like right now um hackathon going on with UX for change and they're working partnering with data center I believe that's really heavy on heavy hands on what's going on right now and actually like you know all these designers, data scientists, engineers are coming together to actually help solve a problem. You know, so I feel like this is the time now where people should start doing this. I know a ton of like fashion designers right now with in the health system that things are going on, like just making face masks right now. So I feel like this is the time for, you know, for us to really hone in and come together and help solve these issues, like you said, because I can't even, like I said, I'm not dealing with that, but I can't even imagine for someone who is dealing with something like that right now. Yeah. The last time I went out was the 14th of March. And I remember this because I was already a bit skeptical about going out because I had I had just come back from LA a few weeks before that. And I was sick when I came back. Now, when I came back, the sickness that I had, I sort of chalked it up to allergies because allergy we have you know terrible pollen in atlanta but like i talked it up to allergies just the fact that i was like in and out of planes i had switched hotels during the trip i was at a conference like i figured all of these things just kind of came into play with like oh i'm feeling kind of you know kind of sick not flu like at all but just more annoying than anything else right and so i had been getting better leading up to the 14th. And I remember this because I was going to go vote. We were they, mm-hmm. they had early voting then because our primary is on the, t- or was, I should say on the 24th, they've now pushed it back. So I went to go vote early in the morning. It took me like, I don't know, maybe like five or 10 minutes. And I remember walking into the voting area in the library and the women there were like in hazmat suits. Like oh, wow. these are, these are the poll workers, like gloves, huge jugs of, of hand sanitizer, masks, hazmat suits. I'm like, is this ground zero? Like this, I can feel like I walked into an emergency room or something, but I remember going to vote, came home. And like, if I would have known that would have been the last time that I really could have left the house, like I would have, I don't know, made a liquor store run or something, but like, I would have done something else. It's just that all the news about all this is happening so quickly with shelter in place and what's going to happen in terms of financial stimulus this has affected so many other businesses out there. I mean, I I feel very fortunate in tech that the company I work for hasn't been affected by it in terms of like furloughing employees or anything like that. But depending on how long this goes on, there's no telling 
what this looks like. There's no like end in sight. Now, hopefully, knock on wood, by the time this podcast comes out, we'll be outside chilling. Hopefully. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but like right now, it's like I'm on day 17 and I'm just like one day at a time. I'll just kind of see how it goes. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, I spoke about like how with design, you know, we could provide tools with healthcare workers or government. But like even just simple pleasures, like, you know, not being able to have a human connection. You didn't even realize how much it's how good it feels to go by your friend's house and just like chill, hang out, give them a hug. Like these little things you really miss doing. But one thing I love is like how technology right now, even with Instagram live and the D nice and the um, quarantine club, like having mm-hmm. a club at your house, you know, feeling like human, having some type of connection again with someone, you know, other than the same people you see all the time in your house. Yeah. That feels warm to me, you know, like really needed right now, you know, to still feel like you're human, not just really just stuck in the house and I can't go anywhere except just get groceries. Yeah. Barely, if that. If that, so. yeah. I did do a, so I haven't been going out to the grocery store only because I've been trying to heed the advice of like stay in order because that's the best way they can drop it off so but even like doing ordering through like instacart or something they're like there's nothing here like half the stuff that you wanted to get is not here you know so like i don't know there's it's just a lot going on right now it can make it tough to focus on work because there's so much other stuff that's happening and you're just at home and it's all like that's the epicenter of everything because you can't really go out and do anything yeah, I think another thing that this has not uh, what I speak with my friends right now is really helping us focus on like self care tools mm. and like what to do right now, you know, to really just not increase your anxiety, you know, with everything. Because my fear, like I told you, I was fine until yesterday when I really started thinking like, how long is this going to last? You yeah. know, like, and I started freaking out because I was like, wait, how long is this going to last? I'm going to have to be here, you know, and do this and that. What about my normal life? What about what I was doing? All the goals that I had this summer, what I'm trying to do. So it's an adjustment, but I feel like I am learning more like self-care tools that I probably needed while I was in New York. Because, you know, New York itself can be hectic. Oh, uh, yeah, that's so, true. That's true. Yeah. So like really readjusting it. And when we come out of this We'll definitely continue doing those things, you know, because like even like this so basic, but even like eating, like I noticed that when I'm in New York, um, waking up and then going on the subway, then work, then sometimes I'm working past normal hours, depending on the project, I just forget to eat. And that's mm. so crazy and insane, but it really does happen, you know. So since I've been working from home, I make sure to like, you know, have my meals and do things correctly and really just take care of myself, you yeah. know. And I think that's no matter what we do or what you're doing, make sure you take care of yourself, especially in this, because your immune system is what's going to help you if you do get sick and you don't want to by any way, shape or form have it down, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, you're in New Orleans, which as of the time that we're recording, this is one of the like big hot spots for the yes. virus now. Yes, New Orleans is because um, people are assuming, I don't know for sure, but people are saying because of Mardi Gras um, with so many people here, it was able to spread rapidly. Yeah, so it is one of the hot spots. New Orleans, I think the difference is New Orleans is more spaced out. So, for example, like my mom, she might like she she works out every morning. So she might do a little run, but no one's outside, you know, Mm -hmm. like because like we live in a little subdivision and it's spaced out. Unfortunately, people are not staying at home like they should. (laughs) But yeah, it's pretty bad in New Orleans, actually. Really bad, actually. I know a couple of friends of mine who know someone who has it right now or even died from my mom mentioned um, one or two people. So it's really bad here now, especially when you in a city. Like what I love about New Orleans is so um, warm here, so hospitable. And for you not to be able to do something that's so natural mm-hmm. down here, it's been very difficult and hard. Or even like, for example, I know, which is so hard, but people can't even like see their grandparents right now. And, you know, New Orleans is very family knit community. Yeah. And so people can't even see their grandparents or even take care of their grandparents because I know when my grandparents were alive, my mom used to go and take care of my grandmother 
And so I couldn't even imagine being something like this. And we can't even take care of my grandmother, who was like differently able. She was in a wheelchair, Mm. you know, so I can't even imagine people who are dealing with that right now and how difficult it can be. Have you been able to like at least like keep in touch with her, like call her or anything? Oh, no, she's not here anymore. Oh, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. She lived a long, beautiful life, though. But I'm just saying, I'm just thinking about the times when my mom did do that. Yeah. That, like, I know so many people are probably doing that now. Right. They can't. And right. that's difficult because you, you don't want to go there because you don't get her. You don't want to get her sick, sick in any way. But at the same time. She needs to be able to do certain things because she's she's differently able. She's she's unable to, you know, move because of the wheelchair. So I think that's really difficult right now. And because, you know, not everybody can afford to put their loved ones in nursing homes or can do certain or provide like assistance. Yeah. A lot of people are doing it themselves. So to even be in a situation like this right now, I can it has to be very difficult. Yeah. To kind of switch gears here a little bit, I know we we really ended up talking about this for a good bit of time, but you mentioned New Orleans. You're from New Orleans. You grew up there. What was it like growing up there, like as a, a kid interested in design? Oh, wow. Oh, so it wasn't so much that I was interested in design. I was just a very creative kid. One thing I do is write. I write medium articles. So I used to like write a lot of stories. I definitely I was in dance in school. I thought I wanted to become a professional dancer, even studying in college. So I was a dancer. Also, I was like part of different activities within church. So I feel like that all kind of brought in my skills to become a good designer. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing that I'm really big on is like STEM to STEAM and including the arts, because I feel like that all contributes to innovation. So even if the person decides to become a scientist or technologist, engineer, like having the arts really help push your creativity, because that definitely helped me because I used to, oh man, I used to dance. Um, There's this program in New Orleans. New Orleans have a lot of free dance programs and it's Nora Noba and man I used to dance every single day go to dance school dance dance very disciplined study ballet study modern study jazz and just that discipline that creativity I really felt like brought into my skills as an mm. interaction designer or more so like innovating different ideas within um, technology I was just going to ask how did you go from from dancing to design Oh, wow. So when I was in college and I was studying dance, I became injured in one of the programs. And so uh-huh. when I was injured, they were saying, oh, you're going to have to like, um, how this program went was like fall, you take this course, spring, you take this course back and forth. And he was like, oh, you're going to have to sit out for a year. And I'm like a year. I want, I was so focused on graduating on time, which did, still did not happen. But I was like a year, I don't want to wait a year. And, you know, I was so upset and I was like, okay, I'm just going to change my major. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I still wanted to be somewhat creative. And I like so little that I knew because I didn't know really much about all the different types of designs. And I was like, oh, I heard of graphic design before. I guess I'll get into that. And so, and again, <laughs> again, like the stories of how I became, got into anything was all a fluke, really. It was like, <laughs> oh, okay, I'm just going to get into this. I'm going to become a graphic designer, I guess. And I wind up, because I transferred schools and I was at Loyola studying graphic design. And I wind up not being so into it because I did, I guess I didn't get the full grasp of it at the time being uh-huh. so young. But once I again fell into interaction design, I was like, oh, wow, using my analytical skills because I am quite a nerd when it comes to research and analyzing and then being creative and combining both together. I thought it was just like the perfect job for me. Like, oh, my God, this is like everything that I've been wanting to do because it's like I'm very analytical and I like a process, you know, and it was like this is the process, you know, to get to point A to B. It doesn't come from thin air, you know, it's very rigorous. But it's some type of line, silver lining to it. So, yeah, that was my experience more so. But, yeah, New Orleans definitely helped me out, especially when we were speaking earlier about my involvement with diversity and inclusion because, like, attending Nora Nova. And, again, you know, design is, again, very elite. I mean, mm-hmm. not design, dance. Dance is very elite. And for Nora Nova to, like, have programs in, like, the inner city – with top design dance teachers who taught 
in New York, Europe, et cetera, teaching us. That was just everything, you know. It felt like things were possible that you probably thought you couldn't even do. So that's one thing that I really admire and really grateful for having that background as like being a dancer. What did your parents say when you kind of switched it up like that? I mean, from dancing to design, did they have anything to say? Oh, no. My dad wanted me to be a doctor. (laughs) 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 He he had his heart set on it. So my parents, they weren't into it. They weren't into it at all. They weren't into me studying dance. They weren't into me. They really didn't get into it until they weren't into me moving to New York at all. I think Mm. they really didn't realize my journey, my path that I chosen until like I started becoming successful into it, you know, Uh and now they go brag and they're like, Aria, what do you do again? And I'm like, (laughs) I'm a designer. What is that again? And I have to explain it over like, I'm an interaction. Like, what does that do? Oh, you work. Oh, it's computers. I'm like, it's more than computers. Well, we'll just say computers. (laughs) You know, and they very proud, but my, like my parents been supportive, but you know, I feel like most parents of people of color, especially like black parents, you know, like they want you to be doctor, engineer, you know, like things that they know you should do. When I was like, oh, I'm become a designer. It was like, what is that? We don't get yeah. that. So. I, I, and I, I think, you know, also part of it probably is them just, I think it might be less about wanting to be a doctor engineer and more about being in a successful role where you can take care of yourself and hopefully them too. Like, yeah, you know, like I think it's more about the possibility or the probability of that than because, I mean, we know that there are working artists and designers out there. But when we think about jobs that like have some level of respect or prestige or make money, it does end up being those kind of like doctor, lawyer, engineer kind of things. You know, it's less about being a designer or an artist or an illustrator or a musician or anything like that, you know. Yeah, 100 percent. But that's the thing that I love about what I do is because, yes, I am a designer. I'm an interaction designer. But the reason why I truly decided to go through go this path in with my career is because I always loved helping people. That was one of my passions, because in the beginning I was working at art nonprofit and making sure I was bringing the arts into the cities, you know, where people weren't exposed to it, or kids weren't exposed to it more so. Mm-hmm. And so I was like thinking about going, I was working at um, campus at the time, right? A digital project manager. I already started assisting the UX design, so I already was kind of doing it. And so I just wanted to learn more about it. And like I said, I'm a researcher. So I was on a computer and I was, I found this company and they created this really, really amazing technology that allow patients with, I believe it's ALS, be able to communicate their needs and control things like, for example, turning the lights on or off or like um, turn on the TV or not using technology. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, I'm still contributing in some way. You know, I may not be the doctor in the hospital, but, you know, I'm creating the technology for the doctor in the hospital. And that's when I was like, this is what I need to do. This is what I want to do in my life. And so that's when I rigorously pursued it. I feel like, you know, really letting people know the different opportunities in these in choosing to become a designer is one of the big things or even being in the creative field. Because yeah. I feel like sometimes people just think, you know, we just color and draw all day. <laughs> not the case <laughs> at all. You know, like, no, no, I definitely do not do that. <laughs> you know, so... So when did you decide to make the move to New York? Because it sounds like you kind of had your roots there in New Orleans with your family and going to school there. Why the move to New York? Again, uh, like I said, this has been my journey. This is probably the theme of my journey, a fluke. I was just like, like, you know what? Like I was working at this um, amazing nonprofit called Young Audience, Young Audience of Louisiana, amazing nonprofit. And I was working there and I was making, you know, decent amount of money to be in New Orleans, moved from office manager to like marketing associate. Because one thing you realize is when you have like any type of green design, the first thing they make you do, no matter what you want to do, like you definitely step out of design. They're like, oh, you study graphic design? Oh, we need help with this. And like they pull you back in. And it was just like I was working one day and I always wanted to move to New York since I was a child. And I just... Went to my mom because I was still at home. I believe I was 24, 25. And mm-hmm. I was like, 
I'm moving to New York. And my mom was like, what, what money? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going to start saving and I'm going to move. And I, then I like, I went, I picked the day in the calendar. I was like, September 6th, that's when I moved. My mom was like, why September 6th? I was like, I don't know. This is, this is just a plan. And I did it, which is so crazy. I told my friends, I can imagine now my best friend, Tracy, it's like, where are you going to live? And it was just, I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have a job at the time. Everything kind of fell into place. Cause of course I wasn't homeless, you know, but yeah, I was working in restaurants for a good time when mm-hmm. I first moved to New York, you know, shout out to the restaurant industry. And yeah, I just kind of, I, what I did know is I did know that I wanted to be in digital. So I did have some type of plan, you know, okay. I was like, I want to work in digital, but I didn't know about all the different types of disciplines. So all I knew was I study graphic design. I don't like graphic design. So those are the two things I knew. I knew huh. I wanted to work in digital and I knew I didn't want to be a graphic designer anymore. So from my research, I was like, oh, I want to become a project manager. But I thought that was being a product manager. I didn't know the difference. (laughs) So I just started applying for those jobs. And so that's really how it all happened. Basically, just fluked. It was just like something in my spirit. I'm very intuitive. So I try to listen to, you know, my spirit and just go forward with that. But go forward with a plan, though. You know, I do have plans in place when I do things. When I decide I'm going to do something, I go forward with a plan and make a schedule and really, like, sketch it out, you know, moving forward. But, yeah, that's really how it happened. And I I saw, you know, from looking at your LinkedIn, you worked at a company uh, called Tiger Spike for over two years as a UX designer. What did you kind of take away from that experience? Oh, wow. Tiger Spike really gave me my foundation, you know, because when I was at Canvas at the other companies too, it was really me just trying to find myself. Like, how do I fit in into this world? So I was like studying at General Assembly part-time because I couldn't afford the full-time program, working full-time, um, trying to become a UX designer at the time. And then finally, like doing just some freelance gigs or contract gigs. But once I got to Tiger Spike, that really set my whole foundation of being a designer. Like one thing I had to say about Tiger Spike, Tiger Spike, it's now smaller in the U.S., but it was the first time I met another black designer. And hmm. I know that may sound crazy, but that was, I, I mean, I not, not for this like show yesterday. I was going to say not for this show. That doesn't yeah, sound no, crazy. That, no, no. <laughs> it was definitely not. I remember I was, so the recruiter at Tiger Spike, she helped me get a contract job. And so my contract was in and she's like, oh, Tiger Spike. She now worked at Tiger Spike. And she was like, oh, now where might be, we're like hiring for this project. It's going to be contract to full time. I'll let you know if you qualify, you know? So we were talking back and forth because they need someone more senior. And mind you, I did not have anything for a portfolio. I had one general assembly project and I made up projects. Okay. She told me, say it was Monday. She told me Monday I had an interview. And then, so I, on Tuesday, I stayed up all day and night creating a project because I know I didn't have a portfolio and I know I didn't have anything. So I like, I just stayed up all day day, night, working on it, right? No sleep. I go in the next day delirious, but determined to do well. And I was so shaky and nervous because, you know, when you go into the space, you know, it's predominantly, like, you know, it's not me. I don't see myself. And mm-hmm. so I walked in and I see this black woman, her name, Rachel Robbins, automatically just like relief came through me. It was like my first time seeing a black designer and she was high up too as well. And I presented her my work, her and two other designers my work. And it was just such a calming relief to find see someone so familiar in that space that I think that's one of the reasons why I did so well because I was no longer nervous and scared. I felt like, okay, she's there. I don't know her experience. I know her background, but this woman looks like me. So, you know, I can, if I don't get in here, I could make it within this industry. Mm -hmm. And I think that really helped me get my foot in a door. And like I said, it was like the foundation of design for me. Very rigorous, but amazing team, amazing company. I was even able to um, travel to London. I was like my first time in Europe and I worked there for three months. So just the opportunities were endless working there. Nice. Sounds Mm -hmm. like you came out of that with a lot then. 
A lot. Yeah, I was, um, like I said, again, just very blessed on this journey. Like, you know, the journey has up and downs, but, you know, the highs be really high sometimes. You know, you're like, wow, I can't believe I just moved here without a job place to live. And now I'm in London. Yeah. <laughs> that was just really amazing. It's funny you mentioned that the place where I work at now, Glitch, the first mm-hmm. week was split between me being in New York and being in London. Like the first day at work was uh, they flew me up there did paperwork and everything in New York that Monday, flew overnight to London, was in London. That was my first time in London, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That Wednesday actually was a conference that my CEO was at and like my boss was attending. So it's like, it's my first time meeting these people. And it's at a conference where I'm expected to represent the company on like day three of working at the the place. And then flew back on the... Thursday, like Thursday afternoon slash evening, and then was in New York on Friday, and then back in Atlanta on Saturday. I was like, this is wild. (laughs) Wow. I know. And for you, you know, you hear about, I know being from the South and being from New Orleans, like you hear about people who live like that, you know, like traveling all the time for work and going Mm -hmm. to big cities, but to actually for you to experience that, it's like, wow, especially how old was I? I was like probably 27, 28, experienced something like that for the first time. And no one in my family ever did anything like that. So for me to do it, it was just a surreal experience. So I also saw that you do some work with Ad Color. You're on their advisory board. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So on the Ad Color Advisory Board, what we focus on is the futures. So the futures are junior level people who are in their careers. And we focus more so on building skills for them to develop so they could carry on throughout their professional career. Especially another big thing is diversifying the industry, not just with people of color, but also different genders as well as different abilities and the list can go on and on. And so what we do is our goal is to create these programs for them. So when the conference come in, we have like the futures come a little early and create these programs that help them develop these skills as well as we help out really voicing and speaking out for like ad color and what it's about. It's an amazing, I've only been in it one year so far. This is my second year. And it's been a really amazing experience because we're working with people in, in all different industry because you're also, it's pr- primarily ad, but now especially technology, people in tech companies like Google and Facebook are on the board, as well as people in different like marketing industries as well, people with different backgrounds, but we all have the same mission and goal. And that's just to diversify an industry and the importance of diversifying industry. So I think it's an amazing experience because it's, again, holds on to what I really believe in. What we say in Ad Color is rise up and reach back. And that's one thing that I feel like I've just been doing before Ad Color. Now and probably after Ad Color, I've been doing that with my life, just really trying to rise up to like the best that I can, but always trying to reach back to others to make sure they can, you know, come on as well and try to really narrow the gap. So. Mm-hmm. That's what ad color is about. And it's it's been a, a dope, dope experience. When you kind of look back over your career, I know you, you've been mentioning <laughs> getting into design and the opportunities that you've had as a fluke. But when you look back over your career, like what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned about yourself? Biggest lessons I learned about myself are resiliency for sure. Because as I'm telling a story, there were a lot of lows. There was a lot of times, especially when I first moved to New York, I was really struggling like financially and trying to make it. And there were times where I just really thought, you know, maybe I need to go back home. Maybe I can't do it. But I'm telling you, hard times really help you. Like, you know how they say hard times help build character. And you're like, yeah, whatever, because you're going through the hard time. But when you look back, you're like, yeah, no, it really did help me build my resiliency. I feel like everything that I went through, no matter it was like the hardships of making it into New York or 
it was very heartbreaking for me because I did want to go to one of the top design schools. And when I was speaking with my mom at the time, it was like, well, you can't we can't afford it right now. Um, You can't really afford it yourself, you know, with how you're trying to pay for things or how it's going to happen. So really me trying to strategize and figure out ways on, okay, I want to become this user experience designer. I want to become this interaction designer. I want to work at these companies. How do I get there? Mm -hmm. You know, so really building that skill of becoming strategic. And I I feel like also, you know, the skill of becoming like being a fighter, man, like really being a fighter in the sense of um, standing on what I believe in, you know, like as far as, like I said, like diversifying the industry, making sure more of us are in a space and not just talking about it, but actually being about it. You know, actually trying to create these programs. Like I said, it was very, um, the mentorship program, Frog Mentors, was very prototype. It was not a refined program by any means, but I just created it. And now we have two, one Latina and one Middle Eastern uh, amazing women working in the industry now. Nice. You know, so you got to start somewhere. So one thing I would say is you learn to just go for it. Like, this is what I want. Okay, this is like kind of like I'm about to get into like design thinking, but this blue sky, this is I want. Now, okay, how do you get from point A to point B? How are we going to get there? Kind of like the creative process that I've been speaking about. Like, how are we going to get there? What are you going to do? And those are the things that I really learned from my experience. What keeps you motivated and inspired these days? Especially these days. Oh, man, man, (laughs) man. (laughs) You're able to think a lot now. So... Like now I feel like I'm really honing on what's my Northern star and my, that is diversity and inclusion. And how do I do that? Um, kind of like going to parks, like that's my choice of weapon. You know, my choice of weapon is like design and innovation and technology. So what, how I'm utilizing it is I'm trying to focus on product inclusion now. That's like one of my main goals. I'm actually now that I have so much free time, I'm starting to take courses in algorithm design, AI and machine learning, because that's the latest revolution that's happening right now for us. And again, uh, we as a people are being left out in a lot of things. There's a lot of biasness happening when things are being built. So I'm trying or not trying. I am learning these skills and learning how to apply them as a designer and how I can utilize my human centered thinking into it. So that's what keeps me motivated right now. It's like, you know, I I now know what I love to do. I now know who I am and how can I play a part of it. So now it's just honing in all these different skills to make things happen. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Like it's, it's 2025. Hopefully we are well past this pandemic by then. Where do you see yourself? Like, what do you want to be doing in 2025? I would love to become a director and some level that would be some a big goal of mine. I also would definitely want to start probably creating a more formal program with the mentorship program where it's kind of like you could say a school but more on the free end for us and really provide all the professional resources that like the top schools will have. Mhm. That would be something that I want to do. And also, like I said, I have all these amazing skills that I have learned from Tiger Spike and from Frog of like how to innovate and come up with ideas and concepts. And there are so many amazing people who come up with these dope, dope, dope ideas in tech or just services. But, then you know, they need help, like with the creative process of how to go about really executing it or how to really solve this problem, like what products need it. And so I want to start offering that service to more so focusing on us and focusing on us as black people, focusing on us as um, brown people as well. And really providing those services because we need all of us in, in those entrepreneurial spaces as well. So providing those type of services. And actually, I'm actually kind of starting on that with a friend of mine. She's um, investment banking. So she's more so knowing how investor relations and how that work. And I'm more on the creative side. So hopefully by 2025, we are fully established and functioning and really one of the top companies doing it. Oh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to kind of, you know, wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? 
Sure. So um, on LinkedIn, my name is Aria Wilkes, also medium. I uh, haven't been writing articles at, right now during the pandemic, but I'm definitely going to start back up writing more articles on diversity and inclusion within design and the workspace and now product inclusion. So on medium, my name is Aria Wilkes. And as well as I'm finalizing my website, it'll be www.arielwilkes.com. All right. Sounds good. Well, Ariel Wilt, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I know that we're recording this during a very tumultuous time right now, just in terms of our society and everything. But I mean, I have to say, like, talking to you has been so refreshing today. Like, your enthusiasm and your your drive for really just kind of carving your own path to becoming a designer is something that I think I needed to hear today. And I hopefully for people that are listening, they can hear that too. They can hopefully they can pick up on just how excited you are about the work that you're doing. And I, I really think that you're going to go far. If you keep that, that attitude, that positive attitude, it'll take you far. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Maurice. This was a pleasure. Big, big thanks to Ariel Wilts, and of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Ariel and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our sponsors for this episode, Facebook Design and Abstract. Facebook Design is a proud sponsor of Revision Path. To learn more about how the Facebook Design community is designing for human needs at unprecedented scale, please visit facebook.design. This episode is also brought to you by Abstract, designed workflow management for modern design teams. Spend less time searching for design files and tracking down feedback, and spend more time focusing on innovation and collaboration. Like a glitch, but for designers, Abstract is your team's version control source of truth for design work. With Abstract, you can version sketch design files, present work, request reviews, collect feedback, and give developers direct access to all specs all from one place. Sign your team up for a free 14-day trial today by heading over to www.abstract.com. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Are you looking for some creative consulting for your next project? Then let's do lunch. Visit us at yepitslunch.com. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by R.J. Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. Our transcripts are provided by Glitch. So what did you think of this episode? Hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, or even better, by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. I'll even read your review right here on the show. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.